Well, hello, everybody, again. Thank you. Welcome to another episode of Dollars with Decker. I appreciate you guys tuning in. Now, if any of you guys that are watching or listening to this on either Instagram Live or YouTube, if you could do me a huge favor um, and make sure to uh, smash up that like button, drop your guys' comments. It really helps out. Um, any of my social channels. I do all this stuff for free to try to really educate you guys. So uh, show your support and do that. And now kind of locking right in, I'm going to be stepping away this week from some crypto and I'm going to be diving into something that is fresh on my mind. So what I do is I am obsessed with self-education and learning and every month or so I kind of really focus on one particular topic. And I had an unbelievable experience um, visiting one of my dear, dear friends, Shelby Elias, his wife, Kelly, and their children up in Lake Tahoe for the ACC charity golf tournament. And uh, my buddy Shelby owns a, a very similar size mortgage company to mine up in Northern California. We mastermind a lot together. We're in a lot of the, the big groups of Matt Ishbia over at UWM on the advisory council. And he's been a dear friend of mine now. And so I had the chance to kind of go up there with him. And Shelby has done a fantastic job with truly really generating some serious passive income through some Airbnbs. Now, I myself own three Airbnbs um, that I have right now. Um, my two biggest ones obviously being in Nashville that I picked up in January of 2020, right before COVID happened. So I've had a very good learning experience managing it through COVID. So in this episode, I'm going to be walking you guys through specifically so many of the things that I have learned from how to identify a great Airbnb, how to go ahead and do the research, what are the best services that you can actually go to really help you really monetize this, how do you get some financing for Airbnbs, all of the things that go in, what the insurance, all the, all the things that I know I had questions with. So I had the chance to pick Shelby's mind, who owns about 28 doors of Airbnb, as well as two a good buddy of mine, Ryan Andrews, who owns a, a couple as well, um, who really kind of pointed me out. So all of this information is not of my own. It is information that I have been blessed to learn being somewhere on the brightest minds in the industry that I'm going to go ahead and share with you guys. So first and foremost, what I want to kind of break everybody down is Airbnb rentals can be an unbelievable source of passive income, far more than any type of long-term rental. So I kind of built my initial real estate portfolio originally by flipping houses. As I mentioned before, it was one of my biggest regrets in life was selling a lot of my flips. Um, I'd probably have an extra you know, four or $5 million in net worth if I wouldn't have sold um, a lot of the flips, which I could have financed, but it was just inexperience. Um, and then what I went ahead and did is I did go ahead and do some long-term rentals, uh, properties in Texas, uh, properties in California, um, mainly right there as well as some in Arizona. And now what I really want to focus in on and what I've been shifting towards is Airbnb income. And the major reason for that specifically is, is the amount of revenue that can be generated is far greater than any type of rental income uh, that you can generate just on a long-term rental. Now, what you need to know most importantly about Airbnb specifically is, is one, the market that you choose that Airbnb is extremely, extremely important. And one of the things that you need to understand very specifically is, is where I see a lot of people make errors, they wanna get into an Airbnb, they just go and buy a house, thinking it's a great Airbnb market, they go buy a house right by Disneyland, they think they're gonna turn it into an Airbnb, they very quickly realize that the city doesn't allow short-term rental permits, they immediately shut them down, fine them, and now they're left with a house that basically they bought to generate Airbnb income, and now they're just left with a house they can just rent long-term. So the first and most important thing that you need to do before you ever decide to get into an Airbnb market is you need to understand the STR laws, the short-term rental laws. You need to find out, okay, are these permits transferable owner to owner? Are these permits that are grandfathered in? Are these permits that are short-term that I have to apply for every single year? What is the city's view on these type of areas? What specific areas within the cities allow these STRs? And STR stands for short-term rental. This is very, very, very important. What you want to have is you want to have a very high barrier of entry to short-term rentals in the areas you want to buy. You want to make sure that the city has already come to some predetermined laws or governing rules regarding STRs, because otherwise you're going to run into, for example, what happened in my hometown in Temecula. About two years ago, there was Airbnbs in every pretty much neighborhood. Everyone wanted to come out here for weddings, wineries, and you had houses in neighborhoods where you had cul-de-sacs with kids playing on them, and they decided to turn their house into a short-term rental because their $500,000 house can generate $8,000 a month in Air Airbnb income, 
And what happened is all the neighbors started complaining because their kids are playing in the street. They're having people come in every two days, a lot of weird characters, tons of people partying, tons of people parking all over the driveways of everybody. And so the city of Temecula cracked down and said, absolutely no more short-term rentals anywhere within the city limits. That is not happening. If you want to do an Airbnb rental, you got to do it outside the city limits. You can do it on county land. You cannot do it on city land. This caused tons and tons of individuals to obviously lose significant sources of their income. And they ended up having to sell the house, turn it into a long-term rental, which is not nearly as profitable. The same thing is obviously happening in Lake Tahoe right now. Lake Tahoe is doing the same thing. You gotta be, I believe it's 500 yards um, from one another. They can only be in certain areas. And with a lot of the permits that are happening, they are not renewing them um, because of that exact area. And because hotels, for an example, lose a lot of revenue if they go ahead and they just generate all these Airbnb income. And mind you, hotels pay a lot of money to the city in the form of sales tax, and so trust me, the, the hotels um, are going to have a lot bigger lobbying power than you as a single individual in a city. So you need to be paying very close attention to that. Now, with that said, buying an Airbnb in a very significantly highly regulated area is fantastic. For an example, I'll give you two cases and points. Number one are the two properties that I bought in Nashville were zoned STR. They have a zoned grandfathered in short-term rental permit that is transferable to owner to owner. It gives a very high barrier of entry because the city of Nashville cracked down on these and anybody that is doing short-term rentals, anything less than a 30-day rental, will face significant fines from the city that makes it completely not worth your while. Now, the great news is, is my two properties have a transferable grandfathered in STR permit. Now, with that being said, what's great about that is the ability now that when I go to sell the property, any future owners... I can sell them as short-term Airbnb rentals. They come with a permit and that gives it a great premium because there's a high barrier of entry. When there's a high barrier of entry, they have a much, much lower supply. Therefore, you can command much, much more ADRs, your average daily rates. Now, some of the best areas for that to kind of give you a specific idea are areas that have, like I said, come to those predetermined areas. The same thing as I mentioned before is what's happening in certain areas of Lake Tahoe area. Lake Tahoe cracked down. My buddy Shelby has a property of his in Incline Village that literally is occupied about 90% of the year. He, I believe, paid for the property just around $800,000, put in about $300,000 into the property. The property now, two years later, is you know pretty much worth about $1.8, $1.9 million. He said his gross rental income that he brings in from that Airbnb is about $25,000 a month. His mortgage payment on that property, I believe, is only around four to $5,000 a month with taxes and insurance. He uses some unbelievable software, which I'll be sharing with you guys later to manage this very easily. And he makes an amazing probably $15,000 a month in passive income on that property because there is a very high barrier of entry to that market. Where there's a high barrier of entry, there is limited supply. Limited supply allows you to get very, very high rates and maintain very, very high occupancy throughout the year. So now, kind of going into... First off, I've talked about is the importance of knowing your STR and your permits. The second thing is knowing is, okay, once I've identified maybe a market that I really like, how do I find out more information? And there's two real amazing sites that you can use. The first is AirDNA. AirDNA. AirDNA allows you to pay somewhere between about $50 and $100 a market to get a full rental market on all the analytics and KPIs that you need to be able to know. Basically, what the occupancy rate is. What's the, what's the average rental rate for two bedrooms, three bedrooms, four bedrooms, five bedrooms? Where is there a shortage at? You know, all of these types of details. So you truly understand the market and exactly what's going on. The second source is called Revedy. That's R-E-V-E-D-Y. What this site does is you can send them a particular property and they will give you a full analysis on that particular property. What the average rental rate will be for that property. What's the expected occupancy for that property. What's the expected annual revenue from that property. What's the expected expenses for that particular property. Any suggestions on the market. Unbelievable reports that you can go ahead and get. Because let me tell you something. Don't make the mistake that so many people do. Data is your friend. Data is what allows you to make money. Data removes all opinion and guessing out of everything and allows you to make a wise investment. So using a site like AirDNA, which I subscribe to for my Nashville properties, and then I have recently learned about Revity. I am working with actually a good buddy of mine, Ryan Andrews, um, who's a fantastic individual, CEO of a major biotech company, brilliant guy. He actually turned me on and we're looking at several properties in multiple markets, Destin, Florida, uh, Tahoe area, Coeur d'Alene area, Palm Springs area, 
Temecula area, Seaverville area, um, and I'll go into those in a minute, and running up reports on individual properties before we ever put an offer in on that property. You wanna know your data because guess what? You need to know how much that property is going to bring in an annual revenue before you commit to buying that property and handling a mortgage payment on it. And it'll break everything down as far as cash flow per month after debt service, meaning this, how much money at the end of the day after paying all my expenses and paying my mortgage payment, basically I'm not wanna put down how much money am I going to be making? So let's say I buy a million dollar property and that million dollar property, I put $200,000 down on, I get a loan for $800,000. Well, what I wanna know is that $200,000 I invested, what is my cash on cash return? Meaning if I am going ahead and making $20,000 a year in net profit after all my expenses and mortgage are paid, that is a 10% cash on cash return. Meaning my $200,000 is generating me $20,000 in positive cash flow after all expenses per month. Cash on cash return of 10% is my minimum. I will never do something personally unless my cash on cash return is at least 10%. I ideally like to look at more like 15 to 20% on Airbnbs, which is very high. Now, for those of you guys just tuning me in, one of the important things to know is I am diving in and teaching you guys today on how to analyze Airbnb properties for investments, what tools you can use, what sites you can use to analyze the properties, some of the big, big mishaps that take um, and going to really kind of dive in. So my two Nashville properties that I have personally, they kicked my butt in 2020. Why? Because of COVID. Now, but now they are doing fantastic. They're doing great. Each one of the properties I picked up for about $700,000. I put 25% down on each one of those properties, giving me a total mortgage payment of taxes and insurance all in for about $2,700 a month. Each property now is renting out and bringing in approximately about $6,500 to $7,000 a month in, in income. Now, after my you know, management fees, which I'm going to be eliminating soon, I am obviously then, of course, cash flowing on each one of those properties. Somewhere in the neighborhood, they bring $7,000 a month of rental income in. After the end of the day, it's probably about $5,000 net. $5,000 net after paying $2,500 of a mortgage, that gives me $2,500 a month in a total cash flow. Well, I went ahead and put approximately $225,000 down on each property, generating me about $30,000 a year. It gives me a cash on cash return of about 13 to 14%. Now, going into some markets, <clears throat> what markets? So first I wanna kind of identify specifically in 2021 markets, what markets have seen the highest occupancy over the last several months, okay? And for the time of this filming, this is July, near third week of July in 2021. So the highest markets per occupancy right now for 2021 is Hilton Head. Hilton Head, South Carolina is maintaining an 83% occupancy rate. That means 83 out of 100 days the property is renting. Followed up by Panama City, Florida at 82%. Followed up by Maui, Hawaii at 81%. Followed up by Myrtle Beach at 81%. Followed up by Nashville at 75%. Tahoe at 75%, Destin at 75%, Steamboat Springs at 75%, Boise at 75%, Breckingridge 75%, Sedona 70%, Orlando 70%, and Austin, Texas 75%. Now those markets are maintaining very, very high occupancy. Why that's important is obviously the more days you rent out the property a month, the more money you of course make. Now where did I get those numbers from specifically is AirDNA I did with a cross reference on VRBO's personal amount. Now, what you need to understand and when you're identifying a property is a couple major traits. One is you need to make sure personally you have dual seasonality. What that means is, is if you pick a property and let's say that property just using easy numbers for every sake is Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Coeur d'Alene, Idaho is fantastic between May and September because it has fantastic lakes and everything else. Now, the other part of the year it doesn't do so well. You get some major holiday functions at the Coeur d'Alene Resort throws around Thanksgiving and again around Christmas. That'll bring in some tourism. But guess what? Nobody's going in the lake when it's freezing cold with snow on the ground and the property isn't near enough to any major mountains for that to be the best location. You're also competing with the Coeur d'Alene Resort, which throws unbelievable you know, holiday events there. So you don't get the dual seasonality. Markets that you get dual seasonality where they have year one use are items like Tahoe for an example. Tahoe is unbelievable. The lake up there is an unbelievable, one of the best lakes in the entire country to go visit during the summer. And in the winter, you have an unbelievable season. So realistically, you maybe get two months to three months out of the year where you aren't at peak occupancy. Maybe in October, 
won't have any snow on any ground. And then maybe in April and May, April, there's still snow on the mountains, but a lot of times not enough to actually snow, ski board or ski and snowboard or into early May. So you get a couple of those months, but you have great seasonality. Nashville, unbelievable seasonality. You do not, you do not have a season in Nashville. That season is bachelor and bachelorette capital. It is music festival after music festival. It's sporting event after sporting event. So you get unbelievable stuff. Seaverville, you get in the Smoky Mountains, right? It gets unbelievable mountain biking all year round, plus obviously beautiful snow in the winter, and it's a great seasonality. So what you want to look at, if you're looking at a mountain destination, how does it handle the summer? Does it have lakes in the summer? Does it have major mountain biking destinations in the summer? You got something like Orlando, unbelievable year round. Why? Because everybody's going because Florida has pretty much one season. You know, it's nice, nicer, and then nice with a little bit of humidity, right? So you're going to gauge that. Another market, Austin, right? Unbelievable. It's the tech capital is where it's moving into the U.S., ripping all that money away from Silicon Valley. Plus, you get unbelievable music festivals, unbelievable place to go for bachelor and bachelorette parties, un -year, unbelievable place around. So you want to make sure you have that seasonality and you, you understand it. So if you have seasonality, meaning that you have, you know, one season really dominates, the other season's dead, I personally would not look into being able to do that. Now, what you're also going to want to make sure when you're looking at things like seasonality, you're also going to want to gauge what the type of property is. For an example, if you're looking in Lake Havasu, California, or excuse me, Lake Havasu, Arizona, Lake Havasu has an unbelievable river season, pretty much starting around April and ending around Halloween. Pretty much everywhere where everybody in California goes and based on where they go specifically, they basically also going to gauge some stuff from Arizona. Well, yeah, you have an unbelievable lake season, but guess what? In Lake Havasu, then you get snowbirds. You get all the people up from anywhere from my, my, Wyoming to Montana to New York to New Jersey to Boston that say, hey, we're tired of this cold weather. We love it up here during the summer. We're going to go to Arizona and we want to rent the house for 30 day period of time. So I'm building two properties right now in Lake Havasu. One is my personal residence, or sorry, secondary residence, and another one we're doing is a spec property. So you have that great seasonality there. Now within Lake Havasu, what you've got to look at using your air DNA report is saying, hey, what is the most demand? Are two bedrooms, three bedrooms, four bedrooms? So in Lake Havasu, believe it or not, you have five bedroom properties that have a major shortfall. How do I know this? Is air DNA report that I ordered told me and said, hey, there is only... 25 for an example five bedroom properties that are ever available for rent well guess what when people go to lake havasu what do they do they go with a couple other families usually right so usually what they'll do is they'll go with you know one or two other families for example myself when we go i bring my family i bring my business partner's family and we bring our nanny to watch the kids so when it's too hot we can leave the kids they can play in the pool the nanny can watch them the nanny needs a bedroom each set of kids needs a bedroom and the parents need a bedroom that's a five bedroom property where well, there's a significant shortfall of those properties in lake havasu so it makes more sense to cough up the money if you can do it to buy the more expensive property because you can garner a much higher occupancy and a much higher average daily rate very very important to know there now, like I said, these are some of the examples that you need to use. And just as a recap, one, when you're looking at doing a potential Airbnb, what you need to understand first and foremost is you need to, one, identify a potential market that you like. Two, identify what the actual legal restrictions and permitting is for Airbnbs within that city. A high barrier of entry is a very, very good thing as long as you can obtain a property that already has a grandfathered in permit or buy a property where that permit is transferable or known as an STR permit. You also then want to look at on that air D and D or revity report, which you can order what the actual occupancy is for the market, what the type of property needs are for the market and what the actual average daily rental rates that you can get and do that cash calculation to understand your cash flow analysis, which can completely be done for you by revity home. That is R E V E D Y home. Now, once you've kind of gone ahead and you found your market, now you're going to need to look at, okay, what is my financing going to look like? And when you go ahead and you buy an Airbnb, you have a couple different financing based on what your use is. So number one is if you're a pretty decent income earner and you know, hey, you know what? I show on paper, I make 12,000 bucks a month for an example. My total expenses right now are only 2,000 bucks for my current mortgage and 1,000 bucks for other bills that show up on my credit report. Cool. That means I have $3,000 a month of bills on my credit report. Mortgage companies don't care about your utilities. They don't care about your cell phone bill. They don't care about your food bill, your health bill. 
So the way it works is on most property types, you can have a debt to income ratio typically between 45 and 50%. What that means is, is your pre-tax money on a W-2 borrow, for example, if you make 12,000 bucks a month, you can likely have your total amount of monthly debt showing on your credit report to be about 45 to 50%. We'll call it that about $5,500. That is pre-tax. That means before state and government get the hands on your money. So that means if I can have about $5,500 a month in bills that show up on my credit report, and I only got $3,000 a month of bills showing up, well, I got 2,500 bucks a month left for basically more bills. So that means that gives me $2,500 a month of buying power. So translating that into potentially a mortgage, call it, that's about a $400,000 mortgage amount with taxes and insurance. So call it, you know, putting 10% down, it gives me around a $450,000 property. So what that means is, is I can buy this property as a second home so I can get the best financing rates, get same interest rates that I get on a primary home because I can buy it as a second home. My goal is to use it as a second home for a good portion of the year. And then I'm going to rent it out a few days. You don't want to be illegal and buy an investment property and call it a second home. But if you're going to use it as a vacation home and then just rent it out on Airbnb when you're not using it, totally fine to buy that as a second home. You're going to be able to put just 10% down all the way up to about 2 million bucks. Now, depending on what you qualify for, of course, that's another story. And then basically what you can then utilize, you can preserve some of your capital by not having to put 20% down. Buy that as 10% down on that property. You just can't use any of the rental income that could be generated from that property to help you qualify. You got to qualify it on your own and you're going to get a great interest rate and it's a great way to get into the property, which is 10% down. Now, the key is, is you got to use it and say that you're going to be using it as a second home and you can rent it out for some of the times you're not using it, but it cannot be a long-term investment property rental. Now, if you're like, well, Brian, I can't have just the ability to absorb a $2,500 or $3,000 a month payment. I've got to utilize some of that rental income to help me qualify. Well, great news is we can help you there. Now, for an example, that exact same situation, say you make 8,000 bucks a month, you got $3,000 a month in mortgage payment and bills. Well, that only gives you $1,000 a month of, of room in, your, in your, you know, your debts allowance to be able to qualify. That's not gonna get you any type of mortgage payment. So, well, Brian, how do all these people buy investment properties? I, don't, I know everybody doesn't make 12 grand a month and have low bills. How do they qualify? Well, the great news is they qualify using the prospective rental income from that house. What that means is, is they can say, hey, this house in Lake Havasu will have a long-term rental perspective of it'll bring in $2,500 a month. And where does that number come from? Is when you buy that property, the appraiser does a rent survey, a 1007 rent survey. And that doesn't have, property does not have to be rented out. You do not have to have a history of being a landlord. You do not have to have a signed lease agreement. They will say, hey, this property will rent for $2,500 a month. Then what happens is we can utilize as a mortgage company, we can utilize and say, hey, we can give you 75% of whatever the prospective rental income is from that house. And we can give it to you as income. So in that case, talking roughly about $1,750 a month. Well, Brian, why can't I use the $2,500 a month? Well, because guess what? You're going to have utilities on that property. Guess what? You're going to have management fees on that property. You're going to have repairs on that property. You're going to have time when that property is vacant. So a 75% factor is very, very reasonable. So now that $6,000 a month that you made, right? Now you're going to get $7,750 per month as income because we give you that rental income. Now that rental income helps you offset that mortgage payment and you are allowed to qualify. Now to do that, you got to put at least 15% down. Now I'll be very straight with you. 20% down is the magic number on an investment property. And as I've said before, going ahead and pulling money from your primary home to do cash out to get this, why equity values are at all time highs and interest rates are back to 2020 lows is unbelievable. Now, just to kind of wrap this all up, this is part one of a two-part series on Airbnb income, your chance to actually have real wealth creation and passive income. As I went over how to actually identify properties, what tools to actually review and to reach out to, to help you analyze a property, what to look for in particular markets regarding making sure that you don't have significant seasonality, what markets have some hot spots for occupancy, what and how to actually look to obtain financing and the type of financing. And if you have questions on that, you guys can always reach me on Instagram at, at the Brian Decker, or you can reach me on my email, Decker at modernteam.com. That's D E C K E R. And my name, Brian, is spelled with an I. And you can reach out to me there. 
If you're listening to this on either YouTube or IGTV, drop in the comments below or send me a DM and I will get right back to you. Next week, what I'm going to be diving into is some unbelievable software that you can use to make your life easy. Software like Guesty, that's a complete end-to-end -end manager. It does all your auto communication to your clients, all your check-in, all your checkouts, branded website, calendar from all your different sites, links up to everything, helps you with your reviews, helps you with setting up for cleaning, unbelievable that is guesty as well as an unbelievable software my buddy shelby turned me on to wheelhouse that is use wheelhouse.com what that is is it gives you an automatically through algorithms using artificial intelligence that can absolutely adjust your nightly rate based on the availability of hotel rooms other airbnbs in that market and automatically adjust the rates to help you get the maximum revenue on every single night that you rent on that property with the average gaining on their clients anywhere between 20 and 40% more revenue by doing this. For an example, if every hotel in the area is booked, guess what? They know that and they are going to go ahead and adjust your nightly rate to help you maximize the value. If they know there's massive occupancies, then they're going to go ahead and drop it down. So make sure that you guys tune in next week. I will be delivering this as part two and I hope you guys help this out as of continued support. If anybody is looking for additional questions, whether to refinance the property or looking at potentially financing on an Airbnb income, reach out to me. Check out our website, modernloans.com. And thank you so much for tuning in and stay tuned. I'll be talking to you next week.